terrorist on a French train who, and God blessed him because uh, he got beat up. And the reason he got blessed was he didn't, he doesn't have the guilt of what he wanted to do. He wanted to, he had a gun and a lot of ammunition. I guess he had a couple guns, including a automatic machine gun of some sort and Kalashnikov. And he, he had a knife and he wanted to kill a lot of people. And I'm so happy and blessed. There was a, there was a National Guard there and uh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure about that. And, uh, and, uh, and a, a student, but the, uh, the one who led the way, and I was thinking about Frank, was a, a, a part of the Air Force, an airman. And they were all friends together. And plus, this was this middle-aged fella, and I'm always excited to see the little middle-aged fellas be heroic. Uh, from, he was a British guy living in, in France, and, and his story was interesting. He, he said he saw this fellow come in with the weapons. He heard a lot of commotion. He's, he stood up to see what's happening. He saw a guy coming in, looked like a terrorist with a gun, you know, and his immediate reaction was to sit down. He thought, I'm going to try and hide. There's no place to hide. And he heard an American voice say, get him. And uh, he heard another American voice say, buddy, don't do it. And then uh, he said, I, next thing I knew, I was up. My thinking process just clicked like that, and I thought I'd rather die on my feet going forward than trying to cower underneath my chair. And, and uh, the one American who led the way, the, the Air Force fella, he, he was cut on his neck, he's bleeding. He, he almost had his thumb cut off, I guess. And, and they jumped on this fella and they stopped him from doing something horrible. And aren't you thankful and don't you want to say thank you, Jesus, the way that turned out, because it could have been a lot worse. I mean, you're on a bullet train, there's no getting off. You got a crazy guy with a gun, it's a lot of trouble. So thank goodness they were able to stop that right away. And that's, it's, it's very proud of our armed forces, very proud of those young men who they were on vacation, but when duty called, they jumped up into harm's way and, and very thankful to God uh, the way that turned out. So, in, in, in yes, I am thankful to God that that fellow got his behind whooped because he wanted to do something terrible, and he was denied that opportunity. So that's a wonderful thing to be thankful for. What's that? Somebody ask a question? No. All right, let's uh, pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you for allowing us to be in your presence this morning. Thank you, Lord, that we get to be a part of your family. Thank you for calling us together this morning. God, uh, please grab a hold of us. Sometimes we're like little children and you're trying to talk to us, but our attention and our eyes are darting here and there, and our minds are filled up with all sorts of thoughts except the ones you have for us. Lord, please grab us by the shoulders or, or by our face even, Lord, and look deep into our eyes and make sure you have our attention this morning. Lord, I pray that we don't, we're not so full of our complaints that we can't see you. Lord, I pray that we're not so full of our our plans and our busy schedules that we can't see you, so full of ourselves, Lord, that there's no room for you. Lord, help us to embrace the cross, embrace the forgiveness you give, Lord, so that when we wallow, we don't wallow in despair or self-loathing, self-hatred, Lord, but we wallow in your grace, we wallow in your forgiveness, we wallow in your goodness, Lord. And Father, I pray that each one of us this morning uh, determines in our hearts, Lord, to stand with you, to stand with your people, to be a blessing to the other brothers and sisters who are in this room, Lord, and across the globe, Father. Lord, help us to uh, live lives worthy of the high calling that you've given us, Father. Lord, I pray that we will share the message of Jesus Christ with everyone we can. Give us opportunities, Lord, and please give us minds that are alert and eyes that are open to see when those opportunities come. Father, please speak through your word this morning. I pray that we're not here just because of ritual or routine, Lord, but that we expect to encounter you, that your Holy Spirit will be active in our lives, Lord. And Father, we're not just collecting information, but Father, please, Lord, help us to live the way you want your children to live. Thank you for grace, Lord. Thank you for the, that cross. Thank you for the fellowship that we have with you and with one another. We pray all these things. In the name of your Son, who died, paid the penalty for our sins, but didn't stay dead, Lord, 
Thank you that your son rose again to new life and we have new life in him. Amen. Okay, Luke chapter 7. Today we're going to look at the uh, record of a sinful woman who's overcome by the goodness of Jesus. And the Bible says she's living a sinful life. I don't know if that means adultery or she's a prostitute or exactly what she was doing. Uh, but she's heavily convicted of her sin, we're going to see today. Not, uh, sometimes we say, yeah, I know that's a sin, check. And then we go on with our lives as if it doesn't matter, as if that our sin didn't bring Jesus Christ to the cross. Think about it. If we weren't sinners, Jesus wouldn't have had to die on that cross. If we could save ourselves, Jesus never would have come to the cross. I think we're far too casual with our sins. There's, Jesus is not casual about our sins, and thank goodness he wasn't casual. He did something about it. He came and died for them. But today we're going to look at a record of a sin-filled woman. And she meets Jesus, and she's overwhelmed. She's overwhelmed. She's overcome. She encounters goodness incarnate. She knows what it means to live a messed up life. She knows what it means to live a selfish life. She knows what it means to see other people as just means to an end or dollar signs. But she meets Jesus, and she knows he's different. And she anoints his feet with her tears and she finds forgiveness for her sins, all her sins. Now, if this story seems familiar, uh, there's a reason for that. It's because we saw a different woman recorded in, in Matthew and Mark that poured out expensive perfume on Christ's head. So that's different. She pours expensive perfume on his head, and she, she's not in the same place. She's, uh, Jesus is up north this time. This one was down south. And that time, it was in the home of a man named Simon the leper. Uh, so this is a different woman. Christ said that she did this unknowingly on her part to anoint his body for death because Christ knew he would be uh, crucified soon. But that wasn't even the first time that something like this had happened. It was actually the third time a woman, deeply moved by love for Christ, poured out expensive perfume on him, their most costly treasure, so these women encounter Christ, and what's the most valuable thing they have? Costs weeks or months or a year's wages, this expensive perfume. This is the third time that a woman deeply moved by this sudden love for Christ. They pour out their most extravagant, their most costly treasure, the thing they value most, they just give freely to the Lord, no doubt, they had always used this perfume sparingly for themselves. You know, I have uh, cologne that I've been using for like 15, 20 years. I still got a bottle that I don't use anymore, but I maybe could. I don't know if it turns bad, but it's from high school. Uh, you, don't, you don't pour out your stuff on yourself. You use it sparingly, uh, and yet they took this, this treasure they had probably used sparingly for themselves and just lavished this love upon Christ. When they encounter God in flesh, God coming down incarnate, when they encounter Jesus Christ, they freely pour out their treasure upon him out of love. Earlier, Mary, remember the sister of Martha and Lazarus? Remember her, those, that family? She had taken a pound of super expensive ointment and she wiped Christ's feet with it. My guess is that the two women who followed her were probably motivated by the actions that they had, heard, they had heard about by the woman we're going to study today. So Mary and then the other woman uh, who anointed Jesus' head. Uh, this woman today, her act is at one time very beautiful. So beautiful. This woman broken, distraught by her sin, and she takes her most treasured possession and just not sparingly, not 10%. <laughs> She just pours it out on Jesus Christ. It's convicting. How do I respond to Christ? What parts of my life am I holding back? What parts do I say, God, hands off? 
very challenging. But at the same time, I can remember ever since I've been young, this is a very uncomfortable passage. It's just something about it and something about stinky feet. Uh, it's, it's just very uncomfortable to read this passage. And apparently it made the people who were present uncomfortable as well. And when we talk about the other two women, it even made the disciples uncomfortable. That these women, we're not used to people encountering Jesus Christ to say, and they turn to Jesus and say, here, take everything, take Take my most treasured possession. She anointed Christ with the perfume, with her tears. She anointed him with her love. How would you or I have reacted if we were in that room? And here you see this good moral teacher and this woman who may have been a prostitute, may have been an adulteress, and she's wiping Jesus' feet with her hair. Would you, have been, would you have thought, that's unseemly. That's not appropriate. What, what does Jesus think he's doing? Why would he let her touch him? How do we respond today when you read the text? Are you, uh, I don't know about this. We see the beauty. We see the brokenness. We see the outpouring of her love. And at the same time, I think a lot of us may not have been really comfortable if we had been in that room. So I want to set the stage before we read. In those days, uh, if you've ever seen a, uh, one of those low Japanese tables that, that you sit on the floor, they, they had these tables with really short legs on them because they didn't sit on chairs. What they would do is they would recline with their head facing the table so you could have a whole line of people here and you could reach on the table and get your food. And with their feet farthest away from the table, uh, laying down on the floor. Uh, this was the culture. This was the way they did things. Uh, another important thing to keep in mind is that in those days, people often wore sandals. And the roads were sandy. Think about the Middle East, right? And there would be a lot of horses and donkeys walking around doing what? Horses and mules and donkeys. And if a guy brought his sheep through, there was a lot of things that sheep leave behind. Uh, there's a lot of things to walk on on that road. So when a guest would enter your home, if you were rich enough, you had a servant, and you'd have your servant go wash their feet. Uh, if you've ever been over to Yumi's, uh, our house, Yumi and I, we, have, we do it Japanese style. Please take your shoes off at the door. So everybody takes their shoes off at the door. Uh, in those cultures, you, you wouldn't want to bring your feet covered with all this stuff into the home. So you'd have somebody... Uh, your servant washed the feet of your guest, and if you really want to show them honor, or if you didn't have a, a, a servant, you know, you'd wash their feet that yourself. And this is a, another thing that's a really odd situation for modern people. We, you know, we lock our doors all the time. We lock our doors to go out to the car to check if we lost something and come back and unlock the door. I'm exaggerating, but we lock our doors all the time, and we we like our privacy, and people who are over at my place know that I like my privacy. And, and, and uh, but what they would do in ancient times when teachers, like a traveling preacher or, or a famous teacher, uh, sometimes they would have like these, they would sit down for a meal, and people would just come into their courtyard or come in to, to, the, to, their, to the place where they could hear what's going on, and uh, people would gather around, hear the conversation of these wise people, of a wise teacher, and we see this situation played out several times in the New Testament. Uh, by the way, uh, when you come over to my house, we have a couple rules. Uh, one, you take off your shoes at the door. Secondly, if you ever come to my house, and, and I don't take no for an answer, this is an absolute rule, you come over to my house, you're required to come back again. And we don't take no for an answer. You, you don't want to upset you, me. Trust me. And, and the other thing is, in uh, we have Bible studies there a couple times, a few times a week. We call them neighborhoods. You know why we call them a neighborhood instead of a small group? Because in a neighborhood, you have all different kinds of people. We're not doing a, a Bible study for, for uh, just the, the rich people over here or just the women who like to, to sew over here. I mean, those are okay. I don't know about the rich people group. But I mean, the women's sewing group is okay. 
and, and then you have the you might have a group for people who like to do bicycling that's okay but when we call them neighborhood the idea there is you don't choose your neighbors you get people of all different kinds all different sorts all different backgrounds uh, all different ages and you put them all in one group and you learn to get along because that's what the body of Christ looks like so it's a neighborhood on purpose because we want to welcome all different kinds of people and that's intentional so uh, if you don't have a neighborhood small group Bible study please come uh, you'd be more than welcome okay let's turn to uh, Luke now chapter 7 okay Luke chapter 7 and look at verse 36 with me 36 to 38 When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. So you get the idea, he's laying on his elbow there, eating tables, feet are away from the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping. So you get the picture here, Jesus is eating. And the Pharisee is sitting right across from him, well, leaning on his elbow as well. And this woman is weeping behind Jesus. So not at the table, but farther away, she's weeping. And as she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. She's crying so much, overwhelmed by her sin, overwhelmed by her guilt, in, in knowing that goodness is right before her. And, and her tears just flow from her eyes because she sees her sin. She's guilty. Before holy God, she knows she's not going to defend her sin anymore. She's not going to make excuses for it anymore. She's not going to try and laugh it off. She's wrong, and she's overwhelmed with it. And her tears are just falling from her eyes, and the Christ's feet are getting wet. She begins to wipe, uh, uh, wet his feet with her tears. Then she got down, and she began to wipe them with her hair. She, she kissed Christ's feet and poured out uh, this alabaster jar. She she just broke off the, the top of that and just poured it out on Jesus Christ. I wonder why, in this scene, a couple things I question. Why did the Pharisee invite Jesus over? Was he a truth seeker? Or was it because Christ was a popular itinerant preacher, a traveling preacher, a traveling rabbi? Or was he trying to make himself look good in contrast to this country bumpkin, maybe in his finery. Maybe he was trying to score points with other Pharisees and try to trap Jesus. I wondered also why this Pharisee invited him over to dine in his home but didn't have his feet washed. Why would he do that? It's his home. Was it because he was so excited to have Jesus in his home? Imagine if Jesus were coming over, that he forgot in his excitement. Or maybe he had these pressing philosophical and theological, he just he had a lot of questions and he thought, I want to I talk to Jesus about predestination. I want to talk to Jesus about those, those seven days in Genesis or whatever, you know, the things that you would you'd want to talk if you had the opportunity. And crowded, all these theological concerns crowded maybe out the practical things. He forgot to... He forgot to set the table. He forgot to have Christ's feet washed. Uh, I don't know. Just having such a wonderful guest. Or was it because he knew that a crowd would form and he, he wanted to visually put Christ at a disadvantage? Maybe he liked in his mind the imagery of himself sitting there clean and in his finery and Jesus laying there covered with dust from his travels. You remember he said, I don't even have a place to call my own. Slept with a rock underneath his head. And his feet, all grimy, so where people who are gathering around hear him talk, see this Pharisee, the religious leader of the community, and then they see this traveling preacher with dirty feet. Maybe he even wanted Jesus to know his place. Now he's trying to make himself feel in a position of superiority during the conversation. Here I am all washed and clean and ready for dinner and look at you, you're a guest and you don't really deserve to be here and I have, I'm providing this for you. I don't know. You know, I don't know because the Bible doesn't say. But it is interesting that this sinful woman is so overwhelmed by her sins and by the goodness of Christ that she somehow finds a way to serve Jesus as she's weeping 
she decides to wash his dirty feet. And Jesus doesn't seem to acknowledge her at first. She's back there, she's crying. And I don't know if he said hello or he gave her a smile, but his focus is on the Pharisee. And she, she does what the Pharisee should have done, but he fails to do. So you see, the religious person, he's religious, but he's missing God right in front of him. Did you know it's possible to come to church and miss God? You know, it's possible to be religious and miss God. But here, this woman is broken because of her sin. Now, she's not good. He's not bad because he's religious, and she's not good because she's sinful. She's broken by her sin. She's not happy with her sin. She, she's, she, she's weeping over her sin. So much more, she actually wipes his dirty feet with her hair. Feet that were first anointed by tears and then by costly perfume. And Luke goes into detail about each uncomfortable and very emotional act. First, standing and weeping while Jesus reclines. Wetting his feet with her abundance of tears. Secondly, she's so sickened by her wickedness, she's overcome by his goodness. Third, she apparently sees the tears leaving muddy streaks as the tears fall, these hot tears fall on Christ, and they're leaving streaks on his feet, she kneels down at his feet and grabs them with her hands. And then she wipes them with her hair. That would be hard for me. I don't know. You could. She, she wipes them with her hair and, and she, she kiss, scrub brush, thank you. She kisses them worshipfully and then pours out her expensive perfume upon his feet. I wonder what the crowd thought. I wonder if the Pharisees, Pharisee had felt Maybe like, I'm really giving Christ this great honor by allowing him to have some conversation with me. I'm giving this traveling preacher a great honor to have this meal with me. He's probably not used to a meal like this. The dirty street, uh, street preacher without a home of his own should be grateful for my generosity. I don't know. Again, the Bible doesn't say. But I do know that this sinful woman knew that it was her privilege to be near Christ. She knew it was her privilege to be near Christ, and the Pharisee missed that, not the other way around. She wasn't privileging Christ by, look at me, I'm giving you my worship. Don't you feel privileged? Look at me, I'm, I'm bowing before you. Don't you feel privileged? She knew that she was the privileged one to be in the presence of Christ. Amen? Amen. I wonder if we're sometimes, and I, the reason I wonder this is because I know the answer about myself, Sometimes more like the Pharisee than that dear woman. God, I'm going to give you an hour of prayer time. Don't you feel lucky? I'm going to read my Bible today, Lord. I hope you feel lucky. Instead of feeling, oh Lord, what a wretch. Thank you for sparing this time with me. Thank you for opening the doors of your throne room to me. I can enter any time and talk with you, commune with you. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful love letter where you've given me your heart, you've opened it up for me. The privilege is ours. We're not doing him a favor by going to church. We get to go to church. We're not doing him a favor when we give our tithe. We get to give back to him. These are privileges. Sometimes we're more like the religious guy who missed God right in front of him, then we are like the woman who's broken by her own sin, understanding her spiritual bank, the fact that she was spiritually bankrupt, and she was standing before goodness itself, and it just broke her inside. And Lord, I want to be more broken by my sin, and I want to be more overwhelmed by your goodness, Lord. Lord, God, save me from myself. What I don't wonder is what the Pharisee was thinking about while this odd spectacle was happening in his home. You know why I don't wonder? Because the Bible tells us. Let's look at Luke 7, 39 and 40. Luke chapter 7, 39 and 40. When the Pharisee who had, been invite, uh, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner.
Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. And on the inside, he was just thinking, this is repugnant. He's letting the sinner touch him. And Jesus said, Simon, I have something to tell you. And I, I wonder if he smiled. He smiled at Jesus and said, uh, tell me, teacher. You know what? It's a scary thing to try to be a hypocrite in front of God. <laughs> on his face, tell me, teacher, what's on your heart? And inside, thinking, ah. Oh. Why is he letting a sinful woman touch him? He is obviously not a prophet. And Jesus sees right through him. The smile on his face, the fake religiosity doesn't fly with God. Fake religion doesn't work with God. We dare not play marbles with diamonds. We, we dare not pretend, we dare not play house when we come to church. We want to see the real God, and we, we need to open up our real selves to him because it doesn't help us, and he's not fooled anyways, when we try to pretend to be something we're not. Lord God, here I am, sinner saved by grace, and I want to be like your son Jesus. Take me, Lord, change me and break me, mold me, shape me. Lord, anything you need me to be, Lord, please make me into that so I can be a tool used by you to to be a blessing to those around me, to reach our world with the message of Jesus Christ. Lord, I don't want to pretend before you. It's no use. It's no use. We can't hide anyways. No, no masquerade ball, no mask is going gonna, is gonna, to uh, fool God. He knows who we are. I wrote, uh, don't try to BS God for you children. You can ask your parents what that is. Uh, we can say... Uh, yes, teacher, yes, teacher, yes, teacher, till we are blue in the face. And I've told you how about how sometimes uh, uh, atheists or Muslims will call me Pastor Dan, Pastor Dan. I always tell them, I ain't your pastor, because you don't believe a word that I'm saying. You can say, yes, teacher, yes, teacher, all you want. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. He sees our hearts. He knows God knows if deep down inside, God knows deep down inside what we think. He knows us better than we know ourselves, so why would we try to bring any pretense? Why would we try to pretend with God? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, C.S. Lewis once said something to the effect that the best prayer is say, Lord, I want to see you as you really are, and let me come to you as I really am. Honestly. And you know why you can be honest with God? We talked about this a lot in Sunday school class. It's because of grace. Because of grace, we can come clean about how wretched we are. We can be honest. We don't have to defend our sins. We don't have to fight. We can just come clean and admit, Lord, I'm messed up. And we're free to do that because he already paid for all my sin on the cross. Do you know that all your sin, all of it, the worst most vile, hideous things, the things that you're ashamed other people know, the way you've treated the people around you, you say you love them and you've treated them so badly, you wouldn't want anybody else to see how you treat your family. Jesus took that and he nailed it to the cross. It's taken care of. All your sin is forgiven. Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? He's, he's reaching out to you with a nail-scarred hand. He says, take my hand. And if you said, I, Lord, I need you, please forgive me. I want to be part of your family. He's forgiven all your sins. And that's why we're free to admit when we're wrong. Because if you don't take that grace, you're going to be ignoring your own sin, you're going to defend your own sin, or you're going to just feel miserable and hate yourself. Those are the only options if you don't take the grace. Take the grace and run. Take the grace and run. Okay, let's look at verse uh, 41. Uh, back, back to 40. Jesus said, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher. Jesus says, two people owed money to a certain money lender. One, own, one owned him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose, the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Imagine the power in those words. You have judged correctly. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, 
but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You have not put oil on my head, but she has poured out perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. I wonder what she felt like when the author of life, the Lord of love, looked into her eyes and said, you are forgiven. This is not an issue between you and God anymore. You are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, <clears throat> who is this who can even forgive sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Now go in peace. God wants us to know that Jesus came to bring peace. There's a war between humanity and God. Our sin makes us always fighting with God. You can't tell me what to do. I'm going to choose for my life. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. But when you come and you're broken before the Lord, Lord, I'm a sinner. Please forgive. God says you're forgiven. Now go in peace. There's no more war between you and I. Stop fighting with God. Stop fighting with God. He's, he's the one who has offered peace. We couldn't offer peace to him because we're the ones who wronged him. But he's the one who could forgive us and offer us peace, offer us forgiveness. Take it and run. It beats the alternative. The alternative is stand before holy God and say, judge me as I am. Give me what I deserve. And only a fool would ask God to give him what he deserves. Don't be that fool. Take the grace. Take the grace. So Jesus gives this story, and he says there's two people. One owned uh, 500 denarii, another owned 50 denarii. Those are coins. A lot of money and less money. And Jesus said, which one loves more? And the Pharisee said, well, I guess the one who's been forgiven lots. Brothers and sisters, if the Holy Spirit has revealed your sin to you, you know you have this great debt to Jesus Christ. He paid for it on the cross. But if we're, if we're self-righteous... What does self-righteous mean? It means I think I'm right all by myself and I don't need religion. I think I'm right all by myself and I don't need God. I think I'm right all by myself. I'm pretty happy with the way I'm living. If that's the way we are, we can't see our sin. We won't know why we need the cross. The person who's forgiven much loves much. But the person who thinks, I don't have much that God has to forgive, isn't really going to love God, are they? Lord God, I want to love you lots. Please show me how much I need your grace. And then what do we say? You're going to wallow somewhere. You're going to wallow in self-righteousness. You're going to wallow in self-pity and self-hatred. Or you're going to wallow in grace. Take a bath in grace. Just jump into that, to that grace. Let it wash all over you. Let it take care of your sins. We can't take care of that sin problem, but God can. And where am I going to park my life? Where am I going to plant my flag? Where am I going to build my life? It's got to be on that grace. Otherwise, it's deception. There's no other place where I can build my life. Understanding our own sinfulness is vital. It's important so that we will love God more. But we can't get stuck there. We have to say, thank you, God, and then start to walk with him and, and do life with him. It's like a parent. When your child messes up, what do you want them to say? You want them to be sorry. Not just, sorry, whatever, God. What, I mean, whatever, Dad. Sorry. Move on. And I'm thinking, I don't think you really understand. I don't think you get it yet. But when a child says, oh, I really blew it. I'm so sorry I did that. Then you say, okay, it's done. Let's move on. You want your child then to walk in joy. You want to you have them at the meal, meal table and not sitting around, just beat up because I'm so... That was yesterday. Let's, let's enjoy ourselves now. Let's, let's go for a walk. Okay. What's wrong with you? I messed up that week. Yeah, I know. Well, you're going to mess up again. Now let's go. We don't want our children always morose and pouting and, and, and depressed over how messed up they are. We want them to be honest about it, and then we want them to get on with life, right? When you fall down, we want them to get back up again. Jesus Christ wants his children to walk in his joy. He's so wonderful that he expects us to be glad just to be near him. He's so wonderful that he says, I'm enough for you. You don't need more than me. He's so beautiful. He's so perfect in all his ways that it's incredibly 
I mean, to, to turn away from him and say, I'm all this, I'm so miserable, I'm so nasty. I don't want to be with you, Lord. I can't be with you, Lord. For one, did you ever think you were ever going to be good enough to be with him in the first place? Did everybody follow that? Did you ever think you would ever be good enough to be with him in the first place? See, I, I can't be with God because I'm so messed up. Wake up. You were never good enough to be with God. Dan? As the Holy Spirit. I did that when I put on my aftershave too. We're never good enough to be with Christ in the first place. So it's kind of odd for us to go around pouting over our sin and depressed and, and some digging this hole deeper and deeper so we're farther and farther from seeing the light when we didn't deserve to be with Jesus in the first place. It was all grace from the beginning. So Jesus wants us to confess our sins, get back up, and let's do life together. He says, open up that door. I want to dine with you. I want to walk together with you in the cool of the day. I want to do life with you. And so Jesus picks us up again. The person who understands their sin and understands that grace is going to love Jesus a lot. The person that keeps closing out that Holy Spirit makes, makes an excuse, defends every nasty attitude. Well, I would have been nice to them if they had been nice to me. They better learn not to mess with me. They're not seeing their darkness. They're not seeing how messed up they are. And they're going to love little. So have we been finding not much love for Christ in our hearts? Have we been focusing on ourselves maybe more than focusing on the cross? Uh, the remedy is to turn our eyes upon Jesus. We can't do anything about our sin. Did you know feeling bad about your sin doesn't fix it? Jesus died on the cross. Do you think you're going to add anything to it by feeling bad about it? You can't add anything to what he's done for us on the cross. It's pride and arrogance to think we could add anything to the cross. He did it, and when he was there, he said, paid in full. Remember, he said, it is finished. Mission accomplished. I've taken care of the sins. We can't pay for our sin. It's impossible for us. That's why Jesus did it. Instead, we should understand the depth of our depravity so that we can love our Savior all the more. When we draw near to Christ, either we're oblivious and miss the Lord of love right before us like the Pharisee. I don't want to miss Jesus. I don't want to miss Jesus. Or he captures our heart and you know what? When he captures our heart, we pour out our lives on Jesus. Here I am, Lord, take me as I am. Just take me, Jesus. I want to be yours. I want to be a part of your family. I want to be a part of your mission. I want to be a part of your will, Lord. Giving Jesus the best we have, all we have. It reminded me of that uh, Christmas song. Remember the little drummer boy? He's just a poor boy, but he gave Jesus what he had. He could play a drum. That's not in the Bible, but it's a neat story, isn't it? Just coming to Jesus and giving, here, I don't play the trumpet. Will you take drums? I don't have this ability or that ability. I, I'm, not, I'm not super skillful in all these areas, but Lord, what I have, I want to give it to you. I want to give everything that I have to you. Lord, here I am. You say you loved me. You say you died for me. Well, I want to live for you now. Uh, if you're taking notes, you can write down these passages because we're not going to take time for them today. Uh, talking about spiritual gifts. And the God gives gifts to the church to build up the church. God doesn't give us uh, a spiritual gifts for selfish reasons. He gives them so that we can build up one another, encourage one another. Gifts are given so that the church will become unified. Sometimes we think, well, that person has this gift, and that person has that gift, so they can't get along because they're too different, and, and, and that person has that gift, so they're divided. Jesus said he gave the gifts so that we would be united. See how his intent is different than the way we often think? So here's the passages if you want to look them up. Romans 12, 4 through 8. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. And 1 Peter 4, 10, 11. Again, Romans 12, 4 through 8. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. Brothers and sisters, I don't care about religious ritual. I don't care about what routine, routine you've gone through. I don't care if you've been dunked in water or sprinkled with water or had some water poured on your forehead. I want to ask you, have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? 
Have you looked at yourself and said, I, there's nothing here I can build my life on? I look at myself and I can't trust that. I need to find goodness. I need to connect with God. If you have put your faith in Jesus and said, thank you, Jesus, for dying for my sin. Thank you for loving me as I am, Lord. Thank you for giving me a hope. Thank you for giving me a future. If you've done that, then I want to say to you this morning, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Thank you for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.